Welcome back to Technically Speaking. Joining me is a good friend at this point. We've known each other for what feels like a, a decade when you throw in those COVID years. We got together well, during my time at Gorgeous. Excited to be back and reconnected with John Roman. He's the co-founder and CEO of Battlebox and Carnivore Club. They're badass subscription boxes. I've got a brisket on the smoker right now. If you know me, I love my meats. But we're not talking about that today, although we might talk a little bit about Netflix because they did have a show on Netflix and how they were able to handle all that traffic. But we're going to be talking really about reducing your churn. And there's a few different kinds of churn. So if you have a subscription box, you're on a platform like Recharge, make sure you tune in to the full episode. You're going to just pick up some stuff that's just going to save you a ton of money. And at the end of the day, that's free margin as cost of goods sold keep going up. I don't know. I like it. I'd listen to the episode. Hope you will too. John, welcome to Technically Speaking. Thanks for having me. Good to see you again. Likewise, always a pleasure. And we talked about this a little bit uh, a while ago, and it's reducing passive churn. And just the numbers you told me are just so mind blowing. And it's really quite easy, both on the automated side and, and a few technical integrations, and then also on the human side and training your CX team how to have those conversations of, of updating cards, etc. So I'm going to turn it over to you now because I'm doing a lot of talking. But why don't you tell us what passive churn is, and especially for not just subscription boxes, but any sort of membership type product. So if, if you sell anything on with a recurring charge, you've got to watch out for your passive churn. Sure. So, so yeah, everybody talks about churn. You, you have to break it out. There's two different types, right? There's traditional churn and then there's passive churn. Passive churn being when the customer, client, consumer doesn't actually make the decision through action to cancel their subscription or service. So it's going to be credit card on file is incorrect. So there's a billing issue. Some, something goes awry. So if you're looking at subscriptions in general, and when they renew, they, they typically, there's about a 10% on average fail rate with that initial batch. And those are the potentially passive, passively churned customers, right? And then you have to somehow through your dunning process, communication, et cetera, you've got to get those guys back on. And, and a lot of companies, they, there's that initial fail, or maybe their dunning process is, is two, three attempts. Mm -hmm. Then those those guys passively churn and it adds up, right? If you're losing ten percent of of your base every month just a passive churn, that's a problem, right? Yeah, um, you're 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 done by the end of the year if you don't replenish it. Yeah, yeah. If you're not adding, you're just in passive churn alone, and that doesn't include people that actually want to cancel your service and and actually take the action to cancel it. So yeah, so passive churn, we've talked about it. Uh, I think like maybe a year ago, but it's always been, not always, but for the past three years, it's been like such a focus for us just because of how important it is. And if you can change that, it's a lot easier to keep a customer than get in, get a new one, right? It is. It's, like, uh, in a post-iOS world. That stat was on the office, it's, it, but it, it's a true business stat is that it is five to 10 times easier to keep a customer than, than to go and get a new one. And the way that I always look at that is if you have a hundred dollar cost to acquire a customer, and you're excited about that, then you should be thrilled to acquire a customer for five to $10. That's literally pennies on the dollar. Yeah. So that's a really great way to lay up what the, what passive churn is. What are some of the strategies to, I, I guess, a prevent it first of all, because if you, you can prevent it, that's all, that's always better, but also to, to fix it and cure it. How do you prevent and fix it? Sure. So there's a few different things that we do in our process. So we use Braintree for our processing. If you're using one of the major processors, you're going to have this. But if you're using maybe a smaller processor, it's something just you want to confirm that it exists. And it's having that feature of auto card updater. So you have the consumer has their debit card or credit card and they've had it for a few years. So it's going to expire eventually. And the bank sends the new one. If you have an auto card updater, it's going to, it's going to automatically get that new card information from the financial institution. So you don't have to worry about the consumer having to log in and add it. So you definitely want to make sure your processor does that. If you're with the major one, it's doing it depending on which one you might have to pay for it, but it's something that hundred percent you want to have. Besides that, for our, during our dunning process, we use Churnbuster. We've used Churnbuster, we've used ProfitWell in the past. There's a couple of other options too, 
churn buster to us is the best option by far when you're looking at actual results. So we use churn buster during the dunning process. And so our dunning process for battle box is 12 days long. And during that process, we have six touch points that we execute through churn buster. So it's a total of five emails and mm -hmm. one SMS message. It's two emails, an SMS, and then the three follow-up emails. They're not like those horrible, boring, repetitive, same type of message that you sometimes see where it's, oh, your card didn't work. Please update and you get the uh, that identical email. And you don't even know what, what it is. It's okay. Is this Netflix? Like, yeah, your card, like, card should be fine. And especially if your card expires and you're getting it from a bunch of different services, they're all going to blend in and look the same, which I think correct. is just to take a little side road and, and a detour. It's important to be empathetic of what your customers are going through. If they're getting this from you, they're probably getting it from a bunch of other people. And just odds are you're not your customer's priority. But for at least 80%, you're not. Yeah, no, you're right. You look at the, if there's the needs and wants graph and, and you're wondering where you fall on it. If someone's having a issue with their card, there could be personal circumstances, right? There could be a, a, a plethora of reasons and you might not be where you wish you were on the need want scale. I, I know some camping gear is probably not not up there either, right? Yeah, like I love my salami, but if, if I my car doesn't go through and I, I don't get my salami box on time at my carnivore club, it, I'll, be, I'll survive. Yeah, you'll be okay. I have alternatives, but yeah. So, so because of that, you're right. You have to be empathetic. So all of the messages in this series are in, in the voice of Battlebox. They're very personable. One comes from Luke, who is, is the head of our CS department. It's personable. It's making sure everything's okay. Is there anything we can do to help? But another one's from Brandon Curran. He's the face of our brand. He's in all of our videos. And it's him just touching bait, saying, hey, is everything all right? Your, your card's not working, you can update it here, or just reply to this email. Like, we, we want to make sure you get the next box. And there's empathy in, in all these messages, but also a call to action to, to resolve the issue. Same with the SMS text message that comes after two of the emails. But it's it, it's all in a personable voice. It's not big business, corporate automation. It's real, right? And so, and, and what we've seen is so many of the responses are, it's the consumer responding to that individual. Hey, Luke, mm -hmm. thanks for reaching out, man. Can you try it again on Friday? That's my, my payday. Yeah, and I know as a consumer or even just as a human being, when I get an email and, and it's a really shitty pitch, hey, does Rolled Up need more leads? I make podcasts. I've, I've got bigger fish to fry. Did you even do two seconds? You're asking me for money and you couldn't even do two seconds of research and call yourself professional. Yeah, no, you're 100% right. It's it's maddening. So so yeah, so we have this process through Churnbuster, two emails, text three more mm -hmm. emails. At the end of that, we've typically recovered 70, 65 to 70% of those customers that initially on that first renewal attempt of Dunning had failed. Mm -hmm. So we've knocked out two thirds of them, gotten them back. We're feeling good. But even though that process is over, at that point, we pull an export of that remaining 30%, that remaining 3% that, that couldn't get resolved during the Dunning process. And our CS team, Luke and his team, they then take ownership of that export and they start reaching out. It's, so we use Gorgeous and it's not, it's manual, but we're using macros in there mm -hmm. for, for these communications. So it's one by one, it's not batch, but it's good because this is personal, right? So they're reaching out, the CS team, over, over a, another series, trying to get the card resolved. So this, at this point, the, the churn buster email it looks like it. It looks like an email, right? There is some. There are some graphics. There is a footer. At the end of the day, it's it's a marketing email, right? There's some images in there, even though it is a letter. The CS emails that they're doing, they're text, text only. There's not an image at all. It, mm -hmm. There's no color. It's literally text. So it's getting through to the inbox potentially when the other ones might have, for whatever reason, had deliverability issues. Yeah. Um, so so yeah. So then they do that. And their attempts to bring back that third, typically another six to nine days, depending on where the dining process falls on the month. Mm -hmm. And then from that, they'll actually get between 30 and 50% of those guys back themselves. So the end result is there's one and a half percent or so are actually passively churned. When you, you started with that 10% potential and, and you get it all the way down, it's pretty impressive. And the CS team being able to do that, it's just, it's, it's cool just how they've turned 
their department and into that profit center and and focused Mm -hmm. on obviously customer experience and making sure customers are happy but doing it while also generating revenue is is pretty cool yeah and one analogy that i always have is your customer support team and it's your job to support them in making a purchase and we're really starting to see the amalgamation of cx and sales there's a lot of overlap there. It's customers are, are coming in ready to buy. You're not educating them as much. You're, you're helping them solve their problems so that they're comfortable giving you money on a regular basis. 100%. That's awesome. Is there anything else on, on passive churn that you want to mention or that you think we should before we get on to the, uh, I don't want to call it the fun stuff, but I mean, it's pretty fun what we're talking about next. No, I mean, I, I think it's one of those things, if you, the stuff I walk through, if you're, if you're not doing that, it's not something you should figure out in Q4 of this year. You know, we're at the end of April right now, but there's a couple of days left. You need to figure it out in April, right? It, it's like compound interest. Every month that goes on that you haven't done this, like you are just making the situation so much worse. Yeah. You have to have something in place by default, any of the, the, the default options of letting your customers know it's, it's very vanilla, right? And it's not, it's probably the same email that's getting sent every time because it's the same email, depending on your email client, it could all be stuck in one, one little folder if you're using Gmail, right? Mm-hmm. It's possibly in the promotions tab. So it's not even making its way to the consumer. If you send the same message over and over again, it's you're just asking the email clients to, to tag you as potential spam. Yeah. No, it's just, it's one of those things that once you point out, it's just so obvious and apparent. It's like adding an abandoned cart email. It's just, yeah. you'll wish you did it sooner. 100%. Let's take a quick commercial break. Maybe watch a couple of trailers, including for the Netflix TV show, Southern Survival, which you were a big part of as part of the BattleBox family of marketing. We're going to hear all about that right after this. Welcome back. Hope you enjoyed that trailer because that's what we're talking about, which is Southern survival. And just so tell me all about that. Tell me how you got the show started, how it went to Netflix. I'm just so excited about it because you did a blog post and let's, let's put the chart up here somewhere of what happened during that time, because you saw steady traffic, huge, huge spike, and then still steady traffic that was way higher than the steady traffic before. And even now you were saying, Was it 12% of your post-purchase emails? Hey, how did you hear about us? Say from the show Southern Survival on Netflix. Yeah, yeah. So so the show, it it was a process, right? It wasn't like we just had a show and it went up. It was a couple years of us trying and being rejected. We had gotten reached out to by High Noon Entertainment, which is a production studio best known for like Fixer Upper and Cake Boss. So they a couple feathers in their cap, so to speak. These are the real deal. They wanted to do the show for History Channel. History Channel sat on it for a sizzle reel. So before even a, a pilot, the less than a single episode, History Channel sat on it for like six months past. Discovery Channel was next. They sat on it for maybe a little bit more than six months and passed. So it was a rejection. And in the pitch from High Noon to History and Discovery was, just give us money to shoot a pilot. That's all we want to do. And then Netflix came along. They met with them. And Netflix has enroll in the, uh, let's do a pilot, right? They said, okay, we'll do a season. Yeah. So they said, we'll do a season. And we want the right of refusal of up to seven seasons. Wow. So it was, that's just Netflix. What's the budget? Yeah. Here you go. And off to the races, they filmed for about six months and five months and then came back to do some last minute touch-up shots in january of 2020 filming like the second half of of 2019 so 2020 got those last little shots in january went to production and then we just sat and waited we didn't get any communication of when the show was going to launch we didn't know what it was called for a while very little control over everything which was maddening as a business right you need to kind of like plan for this. We had a million discussions on what growth was going to look like. At this point, there was no case study to look at, right? There was no brand having a show in a streaming binge scenario to compare it to. The, The only example was Duck Dynasty, but they were on traditional television. So you had an episode a week, right? This is during the pandemic. So eight episodes. Okay, I guess we'll watch all eight right now. Or over a couple of days, it was a different scenario than it ever happened before for a brand. So there was no playbook, right? There was no one to call and ask. So we finally came on an idea of what we thought growth would look like. We were actually pretty spot on, which was great. 
And yeah, the show launched July 4th weekend. We, in the next two week span, like you mentioned, we saw about uh, 1.2 million unique visitors come. Now, they didn't behave like our tri- traditional targeted or no no but it, that many viewers even at a fraction of the conversion rate you're still gonna see some good stuff you, even the long tail of a few months from now because when did the the show come out so it launched in uh july 2020 yeah so it's july 2020 maybe it's too late for camping season this year people watch it and then they start thinking for next year hey remember that southern survival show i want the cool outdoor stuff now as i start to get it so, so you're right. So we saw the initial spike and even with it not behaving, you're right. Even at a crappy third of normal conversion rate, that many people, sales went the right way. But you're right. The interesting thing is how long in the tooth it's been. We're at this point, 20 months, 20 months ago, 21 months ago, this, this aired. And you look at our, our uh, post-purchase survey currently, where did you first hear about us? And mm-hmm. that we're only giving to new orders, new customers. And we still have 12%, sometimes 13, 14% where it's still the Netflix show. It's created this organic channel that, that we get, we're still getting customers from every day. That's amazing. It's just, and, and that's why I love about podcasting content in general is good content is a gift that keeps giving because the asset was, was produced. And now in another fiscal year, it's still paying off dividends. So how can you not love that? If, if, we want another, another season or another show like it's yeah it's more, more more shows it's i want a show too i want rolled up with lucas walker where i just roll up on my motorcycle to various industrial food production places like amy's burritos and then just walk through the the assembly line yeah, that'd be cool that'd be really cool yeah we'll see maybe in a couple of years on uh on netflix it'll it'll happen but we'll yeah. see Anyway, I think we're up on on time here. We did want to talk a little bit because the company was acquired. And so just sort of in the last three to five minutes, what should anyone who's selling their business know when those talks are early, early on? A lot of entrepreneurs, we kind of fly by the cuff, a little bit of Wild West, don't want to do anything we don't have to. If those conversations are are starting, what ducks should you start to get in a row that talking to other entrepreneurs, you're like, yeah, we know no one does this. So a little warning of, hey, if you're going to be acquired, make sure you do this. Sure. So man, there's a bunch of things. I had sold a couple businesses before, but nothing of substantial size like mm-hmm. Battlebox. It definitely was a new dance that we hadn't done before. Some of the things we did right is the decision was made, okay, it's time to sell. We had to plan for it. So we had to have at least a trailing 12 months that told a good story that was strong financials, showed how profitable we could be, showed some growth while we were the previous owners. And if you're not trying to sell, you, you're, you're probably making decisions that are going to lower your, your tax responsibility, treating the business as, as a personal and not treating the business in its best way for the business. So we had to have at least a trolling 12 of that, all decisions being best for the business, not as personally, which might mean that we might have a larger tax burden, which is a tough pill sometimes for an entrepreneur to swallow, mm-hmm. but it's because the, the business matters, right? It's not you at that point. So we, we did a good job of that, right? Our trolling 12 month was not fun from a tax burden, but it showed what Battlebox was capable of. Things we didn't do well. We did not even think, and again, naivety, that we need to have audited financials. And man, that is expensive, rough. It's it's a crazy concept that you're paying this firm a lot of money to basically give you a, a proctology, uh, <laughs> a proctal exam for, for a couple months. Yeah, just going through every, so I imagine they're just going through every transaction, want to make sure you have the proper type of invoice. Yeah. So crazy things like, okay, so let's look at this order. And then from that, what product did you buy and show us the purchase orders for that and show us the line item for this. And it's a lot, right? We're on the financial side, Richard Toms, our CFO, Ben, they took the brunt of that, right? They, both of them aged a couple years going <laughs> through that, but there were all kinds of, there were other parts of it, right? So part of that audit is, is inventory audit. So they came to our warehouse, they print us an export out of your inventory management system, print them the export and they're, they're checking and okay, let's go to L7 in the warehouse. You should have this many of this and you can't be off one or two in either direction. And if you do, instead of the five things we're going to test, then we're going to test 10 things. But but all of that has to be done. And because we didn't have any of that done, it, it delayed the process. So we had, we began discussions in January, February of, of 2021 
we had a letter of intent by the end of March, beginning of April. So four or five weeks into the conversation, we had agreed on a deal. We didn't close until October. And, and most of that, the vast majority of that, besides some other curveballs we did, self-inflicted, was because of the audit. And if we would have just had the audit, it would have been a much, much quicker process. And then weird nuances, like we renew our subscribers on the 15th of the month, and then we're, we're not shipping. Typically, our shipping window is the 4th to the 9th of the following month. If we sold our big renewal on April 15th, we were treating that as April revenue. Shouldn't be April revenue. Because we're shipping it in, in, in May, it needs to be deferred, and it's deferred revenue for May. So like weird nuances like that, like we didn't know that had to be a thing. We didn't know we couldn't realize the revenue until it was actually the month it was shipped in. So it's little nuances and like... That's just, and it, it's so, I get it, but at the same time, it's like, oh, just what a what no. a pain. So So to sum it up, hire a good accountant early on. Correct. Yeah. If you can't have a, if you haven't skilled enough to have a full-time CFO, think about a fractional CFO, right? Think about paying a couple extra bucks for that good accounting firm, because that's what slowed us down. And it's not like we were doing anything that wasn't on the up and up when it came to our books. It's just the attention to detail, the way to treat something via journal entry, stuff we didn't know any better, right? We weren't doing anything that wasn't completely honest. It's just we were categorizing things in ways we shouldn't just because of naivety. Made sense for you at that time. Yeah, this looks like this expense. This looks like this revenue. The end result wasn't much different, but it had to be organized and be in a way for the third party firm that did the audit to sign off on it. So it was not fun and it could have been, we, we could have been proactive and done that and we could have closed in July. Mm -hmm. That was the initial plan. Even doing an audit, the plan was... Uh, letter of intent April was closed in July and it just wasn't possible because the audit took so long. So I think that's uh, after that, I need some time in the woods alone to refresh myself. Where can people find you, John? Where can people get in touch if they have other questions? Maybe not about uh, the brutal side, but if they want to buy a subscription box, where should they head to or where should they head for just general business musings and writings? If you got anything to promote, now's the time, now's the place. Sure. So battlebox.com, no E in there. So B A T T L B O X.com, mm -hmm. carnivoreclub.co. You can find me on LinkedIn. I'm also on Twitter, but I do a horrible job. I, I suck at Twitter, but I'm there. And then my blog is onlinecaso.com. So I'll talk about e commerce stuff and kind of go into a kind of behind the curtain, additional detail view on stuff. Awesome. Thank you so much. Make sure you're subscribed. Come hang out with us wherever you are. We will find you. And I'm sure there's some links below to click and you'll see some related videos shortly. Thanks so much. Make sure you're subscribed. Stay safe. Have fun. Whatever you like to hear me say at the sign off. Hey. Hope you enjoyed this technically speaking video part of exceptional e-commerce. There's a few other videos here, here, maybe here, here. I don't know how they set it up. So go click them, watch something, learn something new, maybe prevent a lesson and make sure you hit the subscribe button.